the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 725 for Monday, September 3rd, Labor Day, here in the United States of America, 2018. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix them all together so that there is a product by which listening or even producing the show, each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include PDF Pen from Smile. You can learn more about that at smilesoftware.com slash podcast and crossover from Code Weavers at codeweavers.com slash MGG. We will talk more about both of those things very shortly here. And here on this very hot Labor Day here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in equally balmy yeah. Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yeah, man. Other than uh, heat, how you doing today? Good. Good. Had my, uh, you know, got my timetable going today. Uh, got my power nap in and nice. uh, I'm just uh, raring to go. Yeah, I know. I'm going to do mine now. My power nap now. So, so <laughs> you're, you're on your own, man. I look this. It's hot. I, I got it. No, 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 no. In fact, I will start with uh, a tip of my own. I was having trouble charging. We, we, we took a quick couple of days and uh, family went over to Maine and visited some relatives uh, for a couple of days this weekend. And uh, on the way in the car, I have two charging cables in the front seat and my son went to plug my phone into the charging cable and, so that we could run ways and all that good stuff. And uh, as an aside, my next car is definitely going to have car play. I made that decision this weekend. We'll talk more about that. But um, and one of the cords wouldn't uh, it, it would like it would go in and start charging and then I'd get the this accessory is not compatible with your phone message. I was like, that's weird. So he switched to the other cable and it was fine. And uh, we were talking about it while we were up there in Maine. I've got uh, a family full of engineers and, and such. So, you know, there's the, these things just come up. And it hit me that, uh, you know, I've had this iPhone 10 for almost a year and have yet to do a delinting on the lightning port. So I took my, thankfully in my travel, travel case, I keep one of those, actually I keep several of those plastic uh, uh, toothpick kind of things that has the, you know, the little strip of dental floss on one end and a tooth plastic toothpick on the other plastic being a good thing to dig around in your lightning port with uh, metal, perhaps not as good a thing, but uh, I use wood. yeah, you can use wood too. I sure. use a toothpick. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, a, a wooden toothpick. Yeah. So this was a plastic toothpick and I dug around in there and I pulled out a huge chunk of lint and thought, oh, well, that's it. And I looked in and thought, oh, there's nothing in there, but I'll dig anyway. Huge chunk of lint. And then I proceeded to pull out eight more huge chunks of lint. And uh, so that fixed things. And it's amazing how well lightning cables snap right into my phone now so don't forget to do that this is your pre uh well not pre but introductory topic here on mgg today so okay so it was acting so there was so much at the bottom of the port that it was like not making a consistent Exactly. Contact or was it That's exactly right. acting as an insulator or both? I oh, no, I don't think it was an insulator. That's a good question. No, I, I would say that it was just packed so so densely into the end that it, it essentially made the, the port shallower than it should be. And so depending on, you know, the cable and all that, uh, some cables weren't quite going in and making that connection. So, uh, you know, I've always thought that that's maybe you know don't strike me down but it, it's maybe as a small flaw in the design of lightning and it's not I just lightning this happens for, to android people too so oh okay yeah. i've okay i've i've never have it had it happen to me with a usb device whether it be mini or micro or well, regular it, usb it, and i but. you know i tried my ipad too and that had nothing in it but of course i'm not 
putting my iPad in my pockets. And that's really where this, you, you know, is the worst. So, yeah, no, my uncle has a, a an Android phone and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to do this, too. And then we talked about how amazingly dense this gets. It's like wood uh, if you, you know, when you take it out of there. But anyway, so does anybody. So here's how you solve the problem. I just thought about this. A new product idea. I'm sure somebody makes this already, but uh, there, somebody has to make a plug yep. that you can put into your lightning port when you're not using it. They do. And in fact, if you are someone that is routinely charging by uh, Qi, right? Wireless charging, you may well want to get one of those plugs to cover your lightning port. Because now that I think about it, that's the only reason that I plug my phone in. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, everything else happens wirelessly. Good point. Right. Right. So, um, that that may I've I've seen these things. They're they're like these little they call them anti dust plugs or you know whatever it is. We'll we'll put a link in the show notes. I'll find some. But um, I've used them before and and they work well. That they the 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 one actually and the one that I found right here on Amazon too, but uh, comes with a headphone jack lint plug too. Now obviously, if your phone doesn't have a headphone jack, don't put that in there. But um, but I found these too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know. You know, it's one of those things that's uh, that's just how it goes. But I'll put that in the show notes, and we can now we can move on, right? There we go. Nice. So I have to look for some of those the next time we're out and about. Yep. Cool. All right. Uh, jumping to actually, I'm going to jump to uh, I'm going to jump to the chat room here, John, uh, because Brother Jay in the chat room. Uh, says where's that chat room at Dave MacGeekGab.com slash stream that's where we find oh, it thanks um, okay I, I should probably go there yeah uh, yeah. and that's that's always there while we're doing the show live um, so brother Jay in the chat room says for all who beseech an external battery pack I recommend solely this I use it with my MacBook Pro and everything else so reliable it is unbelievable and this is the Hyperjuice external battery pack for MacBook. Um, and it uh, it's not cheap. It's $499, bucks, but it does come with a modified MagSafe power adapter so that you can actually use this thing. This is for pre-USB-C MacBook uh, and MacBook Pros. The, if you have USB-C, there's, there's a, a wealth, a plethora, a whole host of battery packs available because... USB C is is way more standard, but uh, but we will put this huh. this hyperjuice external battery pack in the show notes. That's pretty good, man. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the heads up. So nice, yeah. yeah. Can't wait to join the club because at this point in time, Dave, I have absolutely zero USB C devices in my home. Yeah, I, my guess, as far as I know, I may guess, have something in. A, I got in a goodie bag somewhere, but I have nothing I can use it with. Oh, uh, I have so. I have quite a few USB C docks and and hubs and stuff that uh, that I'm looking forward to finally getting a chance to try. My guess is that uh, within the next twelve months, and probably a lot sooner than that, I will I will move to a USB C based MacBook uh, Air or Pro or something along those lines. So. You know, I was. <laughs> The thing is, my my 2012 MacBook Pro, uh, mid-2012, and it's still supported, and it will run Mojave, but that is the last OS that it's going to run. But I've been looking, Dave, and I was like, you know, do I want to go through the trauma of the USB-C and adapter hell? Yes. Do I, I mean, you have to. Or, or, well, the thing is, no, is that I could get a slightly newer machine. And I think I looked, and I think the 2015 is the last where you could get Thunderbolt and usb three versus USB-C. I think around that. So there's a model that's like three years newer than what I have. So it's not the latest, but I'm wondering if uh, I'm, I'm going to have to weigh the options, whether that's the direction I want to take or USB-C. We'll yeah. See. I mean, eventually you're going to need to do it, right? Uh, I mean, it, it's well, like I said, this machine is the, the, the last one that's going to run that OS. So if I run, want to run the next OS, I'm going to need another MacBook pro. Right. But I mean, eventually you're going to need to go to USB-C. So why kick that can down the road? Why why buy a machine that is limited at this point? Like, right. It, I don't think it makes sense at now if you're going to buy a new or even a refurb machine. And, and that's the path I would head down is the refurb path. Yeah. 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 I hear what you're saying. I'm but you know what I mean? It's like you, you're 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 artificially limiting yourself really to avoid what? 
I mean, it's not that big of a deal. And in yeah, fact, I'm, I'm just doing it to be difficult. Right. No, I, I, well, I've known you long enough. I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will mention. But the thing is, I don't need adapters. Well, no, I would, because if, if it's Thunderbolt and USB 3 or the major connections on, on you know, the 2015, then yeah. I'd have to get some Thunderbolt stuff, which I don't have any of that either. So Sure. But I have USB C or USB 3 stuff, which is why. We I, all do. Well, and you, yeah. I mean, you like, I mean, anyone that gets a USB-C based laptop would need uh, some sort of adapter, right? Because so right. many of our peripherals are and will remain USB-A ports. It's it's just how it's going to go. I, I really like this Anchors, and we've mentioned it before, but... Um, the, the they, they call it their five in one premium USB C data hub. It's got it's so cleverly designed. It plugs into your USB C port. It's got three USB A ports on it for and they're USB three. It's got an HDMI port on it. And then at the end of this, it's it's almost just like a little tube. It, it you know, it just seems like a little cable. It doesn't kind of look like a, a hub, but uh at the end. It's got a Ethernet port. So you you kind of get, you know, for 60 bucks, you get exactly what you need. So I, I don't know. It seems like a good one. I'll put a link in the show notes. Okay. Again. Yeah. Sorry for the tangent, but no, it actually no, it's a good did. Tangent, man. It, it actually did come up within the last couple of weeks because I've noticed the GPU on my machine seems. I'm noticing weird gra- hap- graphics things happening. So I think yep. it may be expiring just oh, on its because. own. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's 2012, yeah, yeah. man. Right. So. That's the thing. Is, right. We don't. Ex- I mean, it, it. it's really interesting, right? Because we. Uh, it used to be that you had to buy a new, especially laptop, like every three years at the outside. And now, uh, you know, that has not been the case for the last almost 10 years. Right. It, you know, we've got you got a 2012 laptop. I've got a 2011 laptop. I know a lot of people with laptops in that vintage that are super happy. And people with the 2014 MacBook Pros are ecstatic still, right? So uh, it's really interesting how much longer we are able to get useful life out of these things. And that's... Oh, yeah. And I recall when I did Windows development, though I'm sure it's changed with them as well, as back then... Well, one, if you're a developer, you probably need a machine that has a bit more oomph than, than the average bear. Yes. But um, but back when I was doing the PC stuff, three years was about the time frame which actually our management supported. They're like, okay, you know, once your machine's three years old and you really need a new one to be productive. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's great. So. The thing is, though, and, and this is the only real problem, is... Because it's not an every three year thing for most of us, like you said, for developers, it probably still is an every three year thing. But for for most of us, it's not. Most of us can get, you know, six, eight, maybe even 10 years out of a laptop. And the problem is now we're not in the cycle of routinely just being like, oh, yeah, well, I've had this for a couple of years. I got to start thinking about, you know, budgeting for another laptop or whatever. Now it's like it, you just you buy one and and you use it for a really long time. You know, major life events happen. You're like, oh yeah, I still have that thing, and it, I use it every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so then it's like, oh yeah, crap. I got to you know, oh right, laptop. Got to yep. Okay, here we go. So it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. It's interesting, but we all still spend a thousand bucks on a phone every year. So there's you know there's still a problem. We will hopefully solve. I don't, I don't mean to say we all do. I was you know a little hyperbole. All right, uh, let's move. Actually, you know what? I want to talk about our first sponsor, John, which is PDF Pen from Smile. PDF Pen is the ultimate tool for editing PDFs. It's so good that John's fire department has to come and listen to this spot, right? Because they know that using PDF Pen, you can go paperless with scanning and OCR. You can mark up and highlight PDFs, right? This makes paperwork really easy over there at your fire department. You can search and redact sensitive info, right? So if they had to log some stuff in a report that they need, 
uh, internally, but maybe shouldn't be shared with the public record. They use PDF pen, I assume, to uh, redact that stuff and they can do it right on their Macs. It's awesome, right? You can correct text. You can insert, remove, reorder pages, move and adjust images. And then you can get PDF Pen Pro down there at the fire department, John. They can create fillable PDF forms that they could send to you after they've come to your house, right? And, uh, you know, have you fill out, like, what did you think? Were, were the, you know, were the, the, the firemen and women, you know, uh, did they do their job well? And, you know, did, did your house stop burning and things like that? Like, these are good things to fill out in forms and you can create your own forms just like the fire department can with PDF Pen Pro. You can learn all about this at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Yes, that's correct. I'm not just you know, accidentally inserting a variable name. No, it is smilesoftware.com slash podcast. And then on uh, at checkout, they will ask you, where you which podcast. Well, you know what to put in there. Our sincere thanks to Smile and John's Fire Department, but specifically our thanks to Smile for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, that was a, a very, very good save there. Thanks. Thanks. Why? Well, it's not really a save. I just, you know, I take what I'm given and I work with it. That's how we. Uh, I was just like, okay, how are we going to deal? Because I heard them coming before you did, and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> here we go. No, no. Yeah. No, I mean, the good is... news is that I live in a street where the fire department and other departments yes. are like right down the street. So I, I knew the there was news. likely not a problem locally, like hyper locally for you. I, yes, that's right. I, I did not. Well, I had one a week ago this. where. So a lot of times when there's an ambulance call, they'll send a fire engine. They'll send sure. rescue one or rescue three. I forget okay. which one. Yeah. But yeah, actually the other day I heard it and I could hear the the sound of the uh, siren and it was winding down right as it was approached. And I'm like, oh, and yeah, they there parked right out of sight of my house because there was something happening across the street for me. So. All right. We do yeah, have more, they, but more they cool use stuff PDFs. down. I know that. Of course they use PDF <laughs> pen. Well, who wouldn't? If you're running well, a business. Well, not PDF pen, no, but they, they do they're generate use, reports. They're, but then you, you know they're going to use PDF pen. Of course they are. They're not fools I'll child, there. I'll, I'll, well, they're not fools. you know, I'll check with them. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, all right. We've got a couple of cool stuff stuffs found to go through here. In addition to the one that Brother Jay brought us in two. Rob uh, says something that has me very excited over the past couple days since Tuesday, the 28th specifically is the new firmware update that brings the addition of AirPlay 2 to the Airport Express. This is firmware update 7.8. This is pretty impressive, right? Because th this is a long in the tooth device. And now, boom, it's also a first class citizen with AirPlay 2. And uh, Rob says, basically, I have a lovely hi-fi in the dining room. However, this equipment is probably 25 years old. He says, as you know, with sound gear, this doesn't mean that it is defunct by any stretch. In fact, some would argue that it is better. I says, I have been looking for an answer to bring this beauty into the 21st century for a while. And it seems like Apple have answered my prayers by configuring an airport express into client mode. So joining his home network using the airport utility app. Uh, he says, I have created, for want of a better description, a wireless adapter for my hi-fi. I then connected it to the amp using its three and a half millimeter headphone jack into my amp's RCA connections. And boom, a 25-year-old AirPlay 2 speaker. He says, I plan to take this to the next level by purchasing a smart plug for the power to the amp so I do not have to leave it running 24-7. This way I can power it uh, on from my iPhone and begin streaming to my Hi-Fi, HomePod, and Apple TV around my house seamlessly. Neat, huh? He says. Yeah, man. This is very cool. I'm, I'm stoked that, uh, that they've done this. It's, it's good. AirPlay 2, I, like, it, it continues to surprise me. You know, I've got a bunch of Sonos gear around the house, and a lot of that is AirPlay 2 capable and compatible. And it's really cool to be able to just, you know, say, oh, right, I want this on that speaker. And boom, there it is. Like, I don't have to think about how to get it to my Sonos speakers anymore because it's right there. So very, very cool. Yeah. But the key cool. is that you can have multiple targets is the. Correct. Multiple simultaneous takeaway. targets with AirPlay 2. Well, and lots yeah, more Yeah, I, I upgraded targets. mine too. Yeah. And here's Good. another tip. So normally, so I have an Airport Express. So I'm not using it for internet. I'm just using it for, for AirPlay. Yeah. That's all I'm just, using it for. Just like Rob. Yeah. And here's the deal, though. So to, if you'd like to know, so every now and then the Apple base stations will blink their light. 
here's what you want to make sure to do. Because actually, when I heard the update came out through an article on uh, on the Smack Observer uh, site. Yes. <laughs> but I was like, well, why didn't my little yellow light blink? Because normally that's what the, the, the certain airports do is when there's a firmware update, the, the light blinks. Sure. Or for other reasons. So running airport utility, there is a box. Make sure you check it called Monitor Airport Base Station for Problems. Not in a, not that a firmware update is a problem, but you have to have this box check box Got checked it. in order for the light to indicate that there's something interesting happening that you should probably know about. And once you run the utility, it'll tell you. It's like, oh yeah, here's a firmware update. So I got it, man. I got Air, I got AirPlay too, and I didn't even pay for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you no, know, that's the beauty of this, right? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yep. Now I just need another AirPlay two device because that's the only one I have right now. Yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. So speaking of speakers, uh, we, as I mentioned, we moved my daughter into her uh, dorm room uh, about a week and a half ago now, I guess. And uh, and she said, dude, I need a waterproof speaker to be able to listen to music in the shower. And I uh, I had the opportunity to check out the Anchor Soundcore Flare, which is a waterproof speaker. Uh, it's got a little kind of light on it that can do a little pulsing light show kind of thing. It's sort of a little tube, if you will. And uh, with a flare at the bottom, hence the, the its name, it's 60 bucks. It actually sounds pretty good. You, there's an app you can get to tweak the EQ if you're picky like me. And you know what? For the size, uh, it sounds great. It's 360 degree all around sound. So you get, there's no like weird dead spots or anything. You just put this thing wherever. And, uh, and it's got this little light and of course, waterproof. Fantastic. 60 bucks. And I, my daughter, I te- checked it out here at the house and then I, I figured, well, this would be a good test. Brought it there. She said, everybody on her floor comes by to borrow this thing before they, uh, before they go shower. So pretty cool stuff. So wow. that's why did she, like did she actually say dude when oh, she yeah. was conversing with you? Oh yes. my gosh. So yeah, this is, um, I, perhaps peeling far deeper behind the curtain than, uh, uh, oh, it, are you hearing that weirdness with my sound, John? Or is that just me? No, no it's just you. Okay. It's bad, though. Huh. Uh-oh. I need to pause because I can't hear anything. All right. All right. I'm back. Uh, that was weird. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, so, yes, she calls me dude when she was in uh, seventh <laughs> and eighth grade. No, I was helping out a lot with her jazz band. And... Uh, Oh, well, that explains it. Yeah, and no, she would call me dad, and I wouldn't hear it because there were, you know, a hundred kids, and and I wasn't the, uh, it wasn't like every dad was there, but there were other, you know, dads helping out, so I just should have called you daddy O. Yeah, and all the other kids would call me Dave, which was fine, but her band director's first name was also Dave, and so she decided to call me (laughs) dude because it was it was just born out of a moment of frustration. She was, you know, she needed something from me. She was calling dad, dad. And then she said, Dave, and no. And finally she said, dude, and I looked and it was like, all right, well, now I've trained her that that's the name that I uh, evidently answer to. So, yep, it's been that way ever since. So, yes. But she also called me, John, and uh, and I'm now understanding how this works. And she said, dude, I need a printer. And so I said, OK, fine. And I knew she might need a printer. You know, in fact, I already had it on my list of things to maybe send her at some point. So, so is dude like a, a lead in to. I need. Mm. No, I no, need no. Dude, buy me something or I just need advice. Her dude is her name for me. So it's a lead <laughs> no. into everything. It's just it's just what she calls me. And and so uh, she said, I need a printer. And I went and started researching, you know, all sorts of inkjet printers. It, Wi-Fi on the printer didn't really matter because uh, joining a an IoT type device to the university Wi-Fi is is a wonky thing because you have the major login thing that you got to do. So she would have had to have called, the, you know, the IT department and and added the MAC address and all this stuff. And also, then once you add it, you know, then anybody on the Wi-Fi can print to your printer. So maybe that's not such a good idea. So I, you know, I was just kind of looking and didn't really care about Wi-Fi and I uh, just wanted to find a printer that people liked. And I did. I found one and I said, do you need a scanner with it or whatever? She's like, no, I don't think so. And then I stopped and I thought, wait a minute, what would it cost to get a laser printer? Because we all, as we all know, 
you know, she's not doing, she's not getting this to print color. She's getting it to print black and white stuff for her papers for school. Oh, and, uh, and I, and you know, you ink per page, generally speaking, a laser printer, uh, yes. is cheaper in terms of, of, uh, good consu- point. As far consumables, as, right. The ink right, versus the supplies. Toner. Yeah. Supplies. Right. So it's like, what's a laser printer going to cost? And I found this Samsung Express M2020W. It uh, it does have Wi-Fi. Again, we, we've we discussed that that has yet to be turned on for. It's a USB printer. It also has NFC if you have a phone like an Android phone that, that can do that or a tablet. Uh, it's tiny. It fits like in this tiny little cupboard that they have. And it was 60 bucks. And that came with obviously a toner cartridge. And a USB cable. So in the end, it turned out to be about $10 cheaper than uh, an inkjet printer that I was going to send her. Um, <sighs> and it's 60. Yeah. So wrap your head around this, my friend, $60. And she's been using it all week. I sent it to her at the beginning of the week. My, yep. The last time I had to buy a toner cartridge. So a little tangent here, but somebody online, I found a discussion and they were saying, hey, you know, if you want a laser printer that lasts forever, make sure it supports something standard like PostScript or PCL, which are two major languages, though. I don't think this one uses that, but, um, no, cause it's but it USB. Funny. It's not a network device in that, right. in that right. well, it's, it's a Wi-Fi device. So maybe it does. I don't know. No, I get that. But then I, I actually looked at my printer. So Dave, I still have my GCC elite 12 slash 1200. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the back of it and it's a PostScript slash PCL printer. Right. It was manufactured in November 1999, and it still works with the Mac because it does PostScript. So that is actually older but then the than thing my is, daughter. But the thing is, the toner cartridge for this thing, the last time I had to get a new one, I'm on my second one, probably costs more than your entire printing system. Correct. <laughs> and I think it was like 150 bucks or something. Yeah, and I cartridge. checked. The toner cartridge is about half the price of the printer. Uh, it's it's about uh, it's, it's somewhere between twenty and thirty bucks today to to buy a new one, but I think she'll get about a thousand pages out of the built in uh, or the the toner cartridge that that came with it. So I maybe, didn't know they more. um yeah. So well, yeah, like, I mean a black, a black and white laser printer for sixty bucks. That's just amazing. it's freaking aw- and she loves it. She said, in fact, she said, you know, people on her floor are starting to print to it and stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, start a uh, start a collection cup. So if they if they burn through your toner, well, you know, what? You I'm, I'm thinking between the speaker. And printing for people, mm. I think she could set up a small business on her floor and uh, you know, I you know make some coin. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, so this next cool stuff found is uh, is something that I found out about because they were sponsors of TMO. They sponsored the um, uh, the website, and then they're also currently sponsors of our small business show over at businessshow.co. But it really is a cool stuff found. And it's an app called Timing at, appropriately, timingapp.com. And it's really a multi-purpose app. You can use it in sort of uh, what I'll call, uh, what's the right way to say it? In intentional mode, where you tell it log time doing these things, right? And that's handy and okay, great. But so much of what we do is kind of jumping around And wouldn't it be handy to be able to go back in time and say, hey, how much time did I spend working on that document inside pages? That's what timing does. It pulls it all together and historically creates this. And then not only would this be good if you're like running a business like you're talking about Skyler doing, but also it's great for sort of tracking, you know, how much time did I spend working versus, you know, messing around today. And it'll it knows what. With not just that you were actively in Safari, but, you know, that you were on, say, Google Docs versus Facebook or whatever, you know, it's pretty cool. So you got to check it out. Timing app dot com. That's a that's the the other cool stuff found. And if you are a listener to the small business show because they're a sponsor, they actually have a deal and, and that sort of thing. So maybe 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 you want to check that out, too. So. uh. All right. One last cool stuff found, John, from John, but not you from listeners. As far as you know. Right. That is true. (laughs) That would be interesting. It could be. Yeah. So he says, um, since Telnet went away in the terminal, and and this is true, as of High Sierra, the Telnet command 
um, is no longer in the terminal. And for those of you that don't know what Telnet did, what you would use it for is you would type Telnet, T-E-L-N-E-T space, the name of a server or an IP address space, and then the port that you wanted to connect to. So I routinely, if I needed to see if our, like if I was doing something and needed to see if our web server was up, I would do Telnet space www.macobserver.com space 443 because we run a secure web server. So it's like connect there. Does it answer? Yes. Okay, cool. So it answers. If there's a problem, it's it's beyond that, right? It's it's answering. And, and this can be a handy thing uh, from a troubleshooting standpoint. But they uh, deprecated it and removed it from the default. That's terrible because it, it really was a very basic network, TCP IP network socket test diagnostic tool tool. yeah yeah (laughs) totally but that's not what it was built to be used for it was actually built no but that's what we all used it for i mean i did the same thing yeah and so if you go to web server you type get space slash Mm. and then it'll show you the web page and it's like oh is my web server working or as you pointed out just the just the fact that it responds saying oh i see somebody there it's like oh okay well it seemed to be working at some level right at some level correct yeah and and it really, it was built to log in to a server in in a non secure way, and that's why it was deprecated because they're like you should be using something like say SSH that gets a secure shell to another server. But again, we all learn to use Telnet in this alternative way. And here's the thing: he says, uh, "I found a." command that does exactly this and appears to even have been meant for this purpose and for other network purposes that terminal command is netcat n-e-t-c-a-t or abbreviated n-c he says you could uh check for a port and do something like n-c space dash v-z www.macobserver.com space 443 he says this allows me to check the port and see if it is listening and what's cool is you get all sorts of information about the connection you don't get to interact with the connection like you could with telnet but you get it tells you all sorts of things about whether it answered and how it answered and uh, and and what the return port was and all this stuff so pretty cool now so thank you for that uh, listener john If you want Telnet on your Mac, you can get it back. And of course, I got it back right away after I upgraded to High Sierra because I went to the terminal and typed Telnet to do something. And it was like, you know, it's not there. And so the very next thing that I did was I typed brew space install space Telnet because I already have homebrew installed on my Mac. And boom, then Telnet was installed. And if you don't have homebrew installed on your Mac, it's pretty easy to install just go to brew.sh there is literally one command on that page that you copy and paste into your terminal and it will set up homebrew as a package manager and you're good to go from there or john maybe there's another way to install homebrew well there's a different tool you can use though i think the installation is straightforward but if you would like a gui interface to homebrew there's a dandy little program and the icon is a piece of cake with uh-huh. a cherry on top and whipped cream and chocolate. Oh, my gosh. This looks delicious. That's a nice icon. But it's called Cake Brew. And they have a really nice looking cake. So if you want a gooey way to approach homebrew, um, there you go. And I'm going to toss in yet another thing here. So just a very quick tool that you can probably access through homebrew. Um, to look at ports on a remote machine is called nmap and that's all i'm going to say nmap you could spend your entire life uh, there are books written about nmap so nmap is a very comprehensive tool for interrogating a remote computer now be careful if it's not your computer because what it does may appear to be uh, hostile or overly Ah. (laughs) overly um to uh, tmi <laughs> got it it's like got it, why, got it. Uh, the thing is it basically it, it it can if you set it up that way will basically ask a machine hey tell me all the ports that are open now some people again may view that as as a hostile action but um but the the command to do that is very simple i think it's like nmap dash v and then the ip address and then it basically interrogates a machine and says hey all these ports are open so it, it would kind of complement what we just talked about actually i thought you said nmap but i'm like oh no you said netcap okay so Netcap. Yeah. 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 So cool stuff. This is why we call it cool stuff found. It's not like we're geniuses. We just call it 
like it is. There well, you we go. could be. We could be. It's possible, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't necessarily equate the two. They they are, uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 a different thing. Uh, yeah. Where are we going with this next? I, you know what I want to do? I want to talk about our second sponsor for this episode, John, and that oh, is no. Crossover from Code Weavers. If you go to CodeWeavers.com slash MGG, just do it. It's, you get a 14-day free trial, right? So have you done it yet? But then just go do it. CodeWeavers.com slash MGG. MGG, you knew that. 14 day free trial of crossover for Mac 17. And then when you're ready to buy after your 14 days is up, use coupon code MGG at checkout to save 35% off of this freaking awesome piece of software that lets you run windows apps on your Mac without having to run windows. Like if you have to run a windows app or if you want to run a windows app, doesn't it sound better to do it without having to worry about running Windows? You don't want to run Windows. You want to run Mac OS. So keep running Mac OS and use Crossover for Mac to run the Windows apps that you need to run. It doesn't work with everything, it, but it does work with a lot of things. And I got to tell you this. If you have tried this in the past, man, try it again. Because if it didn't work for you in the past, they've made a ton of changes to this thing i think it's going to work better for you now it certainly worked better for me now i to be perfectly honest i had given up on it then when they kind of came back around i was like oh yeah all right i should give this a fair shake it's like oh this works great you can like quicken and there's games that work with it and a lot of games in fact and microsoft office suite. i mean you just just go check it out it's free for two weeks Codeweavers.com slash MGG and our sincere thanks to the folks at Codeweavers for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's get into some questions here. Listener Jan has a path to head us down. He says, using High Sierra 10.13.6, connecting a Fire tablet through USB, I am unable to see the volume through the Finder. Do you know if there are any terminal commands to mount the volume. So I want to talk about this in two different ways. First, we're going to just talk about in general, we're going to forget for the moment that we're talking about a fire tablet seven. And we're going to talk about, I connected a USB device and it doesn't appear in the finder. What do I do? And then we might have something specific about the fire tablet seven that might solve this very, very sort of narrow problem. So, well, the first thing I would do, if you, if you put in a USB device and you don't see it mount and you expect it to mount like it's a, a disc or a, you know, something that should mount uh, launch disc utility. Take a look there. It's possible that the disc is not sent to auto mount. This can happen. And if that's the case, you'll see it in the list in disc utility, but it'll be gray, light gray instead of like black or dark gray, highlight it and choose the mount button at the top of the screen. That might solve all your problems. You might be good to go. Or if it doesn't appear there at all in disk utility, well, then the next place to look is system profiler. Go to the Apple menu. Uh, my favorite shortcut for that is hold down the option key when you click the Apple menu or after you click the Apple menu and the about this Mac changes into system information. Go to that. That actually launches an app called System Information, which I like, used to like to call System Profiler. But, you know, these things change over time and we have to, you know, we got to deal with change, whether we like it or not, because we're humans uh, in there. Click on USB on the left hand side and look down the tree, which is sort of listed at the top and see, does this device appear on your USB bus somewhere? Does the computer know that there is a thing plugged in? If it's not here, well, then that is a bigger problem, right? If, if it is here, but it doesn't appear in disk utility, uh, it's not announcing itself as a disk. That could in indicate a hardware problem or like we're going to talk about in a minute here might be something specific about the device. And there are some devices that do act different ways over USB. So you might like with a, you know, with a tablet or something like that, it might be necessary to go in and say, I want, or a camera, a lot of times with a camera, you, you have to tell it, act like a disc now 
this is this is what your job is when I plug in a USB cable. And sometimes you just need to choose that from a menu. Uh, Another that helpful. thing. But yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so there is this tool that I love using and you probably know what it is. Mm. But, um, uh, here's a tool that can help you diagnose or at least track or what your Mac thinks it's seeing, but it's called Hardware Growler. The nice thing about Hardware Growler is that it can show both detection of a USB device, but also if it's something that is disk-like, you'll see that info as well. So it has different categories of things that it'll show you. So I find this very useful. So for example, if you have like an external disk enclosure, when I plug one of mine in, it'll initially identify, it'll say, oh yeah, this is a whatever brand uh, enclosure. Sure. And then after a few moments, once it gets done with figuring out what it's talking to, then it'll be like, oh, well, the volume that I mounted. So so it's giving you the, the diagnostics at different levels. So I'd be curious what hardware growler would see when you plug in one of these Android-based, as far as I know, uh, Fire tablets. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a custom... It's Fire OS, yeah. but it, it, it is an Android based thing, but it's very <laughs> customized. Uh, at least it's been a little while since I've messed with the Fire tablet. But uh, but yeah, but you found something for anyone that's having this very, very specific problem with Fire tablets. You did find an app that that you need, right? Well, I found some advice, you know, so okay. I searched for help from uh, our friends here at Amazon and they yeah. were like, oh, yeah, well, uh, you know, if you have one of our things and you plug it into your Mac or PC, it should show up. But if it doesn't, and they redirect you, so basically saying, important. Yeah, so so first they have advice saying, if you plug it in, you should see it on your desktop somewhere. Okay. So it's like, okay. But then they're like, oh, and by the way, if it, <laughs> this makes me laugh. If you own a Mac computer with OS 10, 10.5 or above, or a Windows XP, XP computer, how old is this article? Oh my gosh. But anyways, they make mention of a app called Android File Transfer App, which will... Sounds like it does exactly yeah. what you want here is it allows you to transfer files or see files. Um, oh, so I you see. May so if the finder doesn't see them, this this will talk to it in its own way. And, and that appears to be what this article is stating. I'm trying to find the Makes date sense. on this article, but it's saying it works for Fire Tablet 4, 5, 6 and 7th generation. I don't know what generation they're up to now. OK, Do you know, uh, no, <laughs> uh, I had one of the very original Fire Tablets. And actually, I was I was really impressed by the thing. And and I know people. So we're at I think we're at fire eight now. Right. Um, but uh, no, no. Uh, where are we? Fire seven, fire eight, fire HD 10. No, these are sizes. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The fire right. eight, fire 10. Yeah. yeah so this are, could be useful. Yeah. I mean, I wish it. I, I wish they date their stuff. Actually, I wish everybody would date anything they publish. Come on, people. Get yeah, with it, there's man. some there's some <laughs> search engine optimization logic that says dating an article can be a bad thing. Um, but I, I don't I don't subscribe to this. Uh, it, you know what I'm saying? I mean, for, for, for the you. sake of version control oh, or yeah. whatever, it's just like uh, because what once I started reading this, it's like making references to like ancient, right. you know, operating systems and like, well, how current is this? But then there's this other line saying, oh, well, this is applicable to stuff for a seventh generation product, which I think is yeah, new yeah. wish. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right. Cool. Fun. Good. I like it. Let's uh, let's move on to Steve and Steve asks, he says, do you have any recommendations for financial software that could re replace my ancient copy of Quicken 2007. I'm currently running Sierra 10.12.6 and want to eventually update to Mojave. Quicken 2007 is 32-bit, and I don't think it'll survive the update. Do you know of any Mac-based software, not web-based, that works similarly? I've done lots of searching, but haven't seen anything that doesn't either cost a small fortune or isn't terrible. Uh, I, yeah, I, I've like you, Steve, I was a... Quicken user from years and years and years ago and migrating to a new package. Um, I tried and, you know, it's tough because you, you think you want the historical data, even though you might not ever really dig, dig deep into it. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm with you and, and perhaps the easiest solution for you is the solution we employed here in the Hamilton household, which was Quicken 2017 or Quicken 2018 for Mac. And you know what? It works really, really well. Uh, I don't 
have a problem with it. You can also use something like like crossover, like we mentioned, to run the Windows version, which is a little more full featured. But ever since Quicken left into it, they have been a much better. It has been a much better product because it is, you know, singular focus now. Right. They're not also thinking about QuickBooks and all this stuff. Quicken is just, uh, you know, that's what they do there at Quicken. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty good. And I will put a link in the show notes to it, but that's, that's what we use here and it works really, really well. And there's a new 2018 version. That I, honestly, I haven't upgraded to 2018 yet. I'm still on 2017 and it slurped in all of my old 2007 data and all of that stuff. Uh, I'm thinking that's still a possibility. Uh, at least I hope so, but, uh, but there you go. So yeah, that's, that's my, that's my advice. What about you, John? Do you, what, what do you use to track your, your finances and all that stuff? Mint.com. Oh, yes. Very cool. And I believe that's an Intuit product. So Mint is an Intuit product. Yeah, right. That's right. I use that. I think they offered, they tried floating out a tax product and, and it wasn't based on your income. A lot of, there are a lot of tax products where if your income is below a certain level, then you get it for free. Otherwise you got to pay the money. Sure. But I remember them, and I think it was another site I went to, Credit Karma. I think they were offering tax services as well. So there's more people offering free online filing. The thing is, I, I tried one of them. I think it was the Mint option uh, okay. last tax season. And I punched in some data, and the numbers I came up with just didn't match the, uh, shall we say, creative way that I do my calculations. Mm. So I'm like, nope. <laughs> yeah and then i did it on paper and it said yeah you know you got to pay this much and then i use their tool and it's like well you got to pay way more and i'm like yeah i'll go i'll go with the paper yeah right yeah 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 <laughs> i i for taxes i actually I, because we have the businesses and everything i have an accountant that that does it oh yeah for us but and i do i do have the accountant uh i pay the accountant to run and file our personal taxes as well but uh, but I always do them on my own, not because I don't trust my accountant, but for two reasons. Number one, it allows me to sort of prepare things for my accountant and have very intelligent conversations with him because I've I, I know what's going on with the taxes and it makes life way easier for him too, which then, of course, saves me money. But um, but it, you know, it also just kind of. I, I, I want to have a, a sense of where we are. And, you know, I always learn things about deductions from my accountant. Uh, you know, he, he always is able to find more than, than I do. And I'm pretty good, but, uh, but I use TurboTax here on my own to, uh, to process all that. And TurboTax is great because it lets you um, really be flexible with the way you do things. It, it, um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily railroad you into, into doing things only the one way it's, it's very flexible and lets you kind of do whatever you need to do. So, so I like that. I, and I use the, the desktop version. There is an online version of TurboTax that is a little less flexible from, from what I remember, but that's what my kids use. Cause they, uh, being students or whatever, they qualify for the free filing with, with TurboTax. So. <laughs> So they do the online thing. So, yeah. Wow, that's good. And and I, I applaud you for making them responsible tax paying citizens. Uh, they have to be. They earn money. They get uh, 1099s well. or, or W-2s. And, you know, like the IRS will does not uh, uh. look too kindly upon people that because if you get a 1099 or a W-2, the IRS already knows about the income. Right. Right. But I've heard of people that have not filed for free. Oh yeah, yeah, but eventually that, that stuff you, comes they'll back. They'll get you eventually. Yeah, yeah. And then and then I mean, my kids don't have to pay very much in taxes. It, it's just the no, filing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, the fi yeah. Well, but both of them wind up with some self employment income. My son's a referee, and so that's all uh, ten ninety nine. And my daughter did an internship for the past two years. That so so they do. They have had to pay. They they understand the concept of finding deductions that will help keep them from paying too much and all of that, which is a good lesson to learn. Not sort of outside the scope of this show, but if you want to learn about that stuff. Oh, and know, I agree. There's a balance. So small business show, businessshow.co. Pay, pay as much, uh, pay as little as you can get away with, I think is the, uh, is the, 
the guidance I'd offer. Oh uh, yeah. Well, it's, 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 you know, the way I always say it is these are not my rules. So, uh, I, you know, find my best path through the rules that are written for this. And I don't recommend breaking the law, but man, there are different paths through the rules that will work out to be uh, very different financial financially in terms of the results. So, yeah, I do. Speaking of financial results, I do want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers for this pat that contributed for this past week. If you want to learn about MGG premium, of course, at macgeekgab.com slash premium is where you go. Uh, on the $25 every six month plan, we had uh, the following people contribute in the last week, either newly or in a renewal fashion. Eric WB, Gene R, Bartek B, Bruce W, Randall S, Jim E, Jeff S, Daniel C, Doug S, Rob H, Bob P, Matt C, and Tony B. Thank you to all of you. Uh, you rock. On the monthly plan uh, at 10 bucks, we have Ev the Nerd. Thank you. Nick S, Robert D, John B, but not this John B, different John B. You know who you are. Thank you. Or you know. That's right. Beth B, that's correct. Yep. Uh, Ward J, Greg S, Olga P, Michael L, Bob P, but a different Bob P than the one I mentioned and thanked on the biannual plan. So distinguish. J Jason A, Stephen A, and uh, those were all at $10. Uh, monthly and then Christopher S now at $20 monthly. Thank you so much to all of you. You all rock everybody. It just by listening to this show, you rock and uh, you know that because you contribute questions and things and awesome stuff. In fact, Christopher has a great question, which goes like this. He says, I have a late 2012 Mac mini with 16 gigs of Ram and a one terabyte hard drive that I recently replaced with a new 2017 iMac for my wife. The Mac mini works fine. It was just getting long in the tooth. The question is, what is the best use of this old Mac mini moving forward? Do you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations of how I can use it? I don't need it for desktop computing as we both now have 27 inch iMacs at home and I have a mirrored version at work. All I carry now is an iPad to and from work for mobile use. All right, Christopher. Uh, and Christopher also a premium member. So thank you for that. Uh, as for that Mac mini, you know, I, I think about, well, okay, it could become a server of some sort, right? Uh, Plex jumps to mind, you know, but in general, a media server. So that could be an iTunes server. It could be, uh, you know, you could run a Kodi server on it. If you're so inclined, KODI, uh, you could run Mac OS server if you want to share files in a more uh, share files and resources, I should say on your network in a more uh, robust way. You could make it a time machine backup server. You could run own cloud or next cloud on it. We talked about those in the previous episode. Uh, really the, the options are endless, but again, media server is kind of the thing that, that comes to mind because it, it is so relevant for so many people now to run something like a Plex server, especially if you've got an Apple TV four on your, uh, you know, on your TV, because you can get the Plex app for your Apple TV four. And now look at, you know, all of your library, you could also do the same thing with iTunes and put all your movies in there and, and then browse them, you know, from an Apple TV or from your Mac or from your iPhone or whatever. So, and it could also be, uh, uh, another TV, right? If you put a display on that thing, you can, I think that might, might even have an IR port for a remote control, but if not, you can get one. And, uh, and then you can, yes, right. You can, and then you can run, I mean, it could be not just your server, but it could be the thing that displays on your TV, like, or on your screen, which then becomes TV. So lots of options. What do you think? John? Yeah. And uh, looking at those machines, so I have the 2014, do I have? What do I have here? I think I have the 2014. But the 2012 is is very similar. <clears throat> uh, the thing is, so, so it supports, uh, from what I see here, yeah, I had a 2012, and then I got the 2014, I think. So um, it has a SATA 3 port for the hard drive mm -hmm. that you put in there, but I think it also has a e, e SATA port. Okay. 
because I'm looking at the description for the 2012 and 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 later, and it looks like because you could get the option of getting a fusion drive, that would imply to me that the machine must have more than one hard drive port. So I think that class of machine has both. So the, what I'm saying is that you can put a drive in there. Uh, and unfortunately, and I just experienced this, I was hanging with my family over the weekend. And my mom has an older iMac and it has a throttled hard drive and it just makes me sad. So even though it has a SATA 3 port, the rotational drive in there is limited to SATA 2, which makes me mm. again very upset. Right, right. So, so if it doesn't have a higher performing drive, put one in there. It's 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 kind of a pain to get into and out of. They they you know they could have well, done a better I mean, job. I would I would slow down on that advice and first. Nope. Right. Well, I mean, it, like you said, only because it's a pain to get in in and out of there. If if the drive doesn't need to be replaced and you're not doing something with it that requires a fast drive, I would frankly just leave the drive alone and or. Uh, hang an external off of it because if you're going to put a media library on there you might wind up wanting a lot more storage anyway and, and it has usb3 so yeah. okay no i'm and, with and you it's media, just media is is requires pretty pretty low bandwidth in terms of disk speed and to you know i mean you can even stream hd stuff it's or 4k stuff for that matter any disk uh, you've got in there is going to it's going to handle that and and I'm just offering it as an observation because when I got my machine, it had the most, it it had the same scenario is that it came with a one terabyte rotational SATA two throttled drive in a machine that has SATA three. So I'm just suggesting that if you're going to make, if you're going to repurpose it, you may want to make it as. Okay. So two points here. So yeah. Yeah, I don't don't know that it needs to be fast. Yeah. But the USB three ports, which go at five gigabits may do enough for you combined yep. with an SSD to give you the throughput that you want, or even a good rotational drive. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, really, I mean, it, the, the only reason not to go with an external rotational is noise. If it is going to be your TV, think about that because the a rotational drive will make some amount of noise uh, and that, you know, again, once you get sound going and stuff in in the room, it may or may not be noticeable, but, but think about that. So, yeah. 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 And, and he's got 16 gigs in there. So that's, that's plenty for yeah. anything. Right. So, well, um, yeah. Okay. okay. So that was my only observation. You maybe yeah. you may want to think about your internal or external media options. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Um, it, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't mean to pick on you, John, but this is, this is, a, well, you know, but, it, <laughs> but no, you, you bring up, a really good point that I find uh, for anyone advising people on, you know, technology. And I know we have a lot of consultants that listen to, to the show. And I do like to sort of acknowledge that and, and even cater to that at times. And this is going to be one of those times. It's really easy, especially in a scenario like this, right. To think about what would I do if it were mine and I were repurposing, you know, or, or doing whatever it is, right. In this case, you know, if I were doing this and, you know, right away, John, you went to, if it were mine, I would put a much better drive in these drives drive me crazy and yada, yada, yada. Right. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is important when, you know, thinking about advising others like, okay, well, my, I'm a geek, right? Self-professed, you know, card carrying. So maybe, you know, you're not. And it's always important to remember what the client's needs are and to separate that. Because, And I, you know, I, I used to, when we managed the team of nerds down at Computer Nerds in Austin, it was not uncommon, especially when I brought a new nerd on board, that I would get a call, you know, sometimes right away after they'd been out, but oftentimes it was, you know, six months, eight months later, somebody would call in and say, oh yeah, I'm having a problem. You know, so-and-so came out and, uh, you know, months ago, but I'm having a problem with this thing and I don't understand it. It's like, what's going on? Oh, okay. They installed, it would be akin to installing something like, you know, iStat menus, which me as a geek, I can't deal with using a computer without having that, Right. But I know that that's me and I don't need to impose anything on my customers that they don't need and or request. So I always just make sure to think about that when you're, you know, when you're when I'm dispensing advice and my advice to 
all of you consultants is to consider the same thing. What's the, what does the customer need? Uh, and, and, and sometimes it does mean saying, Hey, if this were mine, you know, I would also put a new drive in. And the reason you might want to consider that now, as opposed to down the road is putting a new drive in, replacing a drive. Once the machine is, we're going to have to set it up anyway, replacing the drive now means we get to set it all up on a new drive as opposed to, you know, six, eight, you know, 12, 18 months down the road. Oh, we need a new drive. Okay. Now we've got to take this thing. It's not that big of a deal. You carbon copy cloner it over and whatever, but, um, but it's always good just to, you know, frame the, I, I have to frame it for myself so that I'm not imposing my wishes on my customers. I tell them what I would do, explain all the options and then stop and listen to what they want and then just do it. So there you go. And a lot, and there have been times where it's like somebody says, yep, I'm, I hear you. I want to choose plan B, even though I'm saying plan B is a bad idea. It's like, okay, that's fine. Let's go. All right. Yeah. All I'm going to say is that the reason I did, I said what I said is yeah. because I had upgraded my parents' 2012 iMac, which had a SATA 2 throttle drive. It was an El Capitan. And the thing is, every now and then when, when I'm at their place, I check the machine out and I'm like, you know what? El Capitan, that's, that's or actually I think it had Yosemite. And I'm like, you know what? Um, it may be time to upgrade it. The thing is, dude, the upgrade took 45 minutes. Yep. The, in this case... The t and it's because it was a, a clunky rotational throttle drive, in my humble opinion. Fair. It, it, would, it should yeah. have happened a lot faster. And I was just like, oh, gosh, I wish we had ordered this thing with a better drive. So, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's still fine for, for, for what, what they use it for, which is mostly photo management and, and all that and email. It's fine. But it just made the, the upgrade process incredibly time consuming yep. versus... And that and that's like valuable stuff to to share. Like, okay, that we can stick with the drive that's in there, but there's going to be all these things that might really, the speed of this thing might really become a factor, or maybe not. Right? You know. And so that's that's where your expertise and your history and all that comes in. So, all right. right now, while we're on the subject of rotational drives, John Doug had a question. He said, "What?" Is the current guidance of using carbon copy cloner on a destination APFS rotational drive? Back in March, the guidance was no. But with Mojave supporting Fusion and other rotational drives with APFS, has that guidance changed? You, using APFS as a destination seems to show advantages uh, if it's solid on rotational devices. Uh, so, yeah, I'm eager as well to take advantage of the benefits of APFS on my external drives, right? The, the malleable storage blob where you can, it's not even repartitioning. It's just, you know, reassigning storage back and forth uh, on an external drive, especially can be a benefit, right? You know, I think there's going to be some weirdness with that when it comes to rotational drives, because things really are laid out physically on the drive. So I'm, I'm curious to see, how APFS is adapted to do that. Uh, APFS really isn't built in that sense for rotational drives. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious how that works. I, I, you know, I think officially I'd still say wait, uh, you know, but, but that said, you've had decent luck, right, John? So the thing is, I, I recently made a change in my setup, but I would say for maybe not a year, but at least several months, I've been running uh, using Carpet Copy Cloner, APFS yep. external rotational drives to do my backup. Okay. And I have not received any complaints from Drive Genius or Drive Pulse, which I used to, but I think that was a bug in the OS. So the, the OS was saying, well, there's something wrong. And so Drive Genius was like, oh, well, the OS says there's something wrong. So I'm going to tell the user there's something wrong, even though there wasn't anything actually wrong. Oh, so, I remember that. Yeah, right. OK. Because the thing is, in uh, Carbon Copy Cloner, has a, it's kind of hidden. But there's an option that basically does a verification. And it's called, I think it's called Find and Replace Corrupted Files is an option when you create a backup. And I think they call it like backup integrity, but the, basically what it does is every now and then it's like, you know what, let me compare what's on the backup to what's on the machine. And if there's 
anything that's different, I'll tell you about it, which to me was the test of, is there anything really wrong? And this test never came up and said there was anything, there was any discrepancy between the source and the destination. Sure. So I'm like, the, the message is, is a lie. Maybe yeah. not a lie. No, it's a lie. <laughs> Well, it was doing what it thought, but but then also, so you had asked me also, Dave, and so that's why I said I, d- I didn't entirely answer the question. You were like, have you ever booted from an external APFS rotational drive? And my answer is no, I have not. No, I don't think you can with, up until Mojave. I, oh, I, think, I think I can. Oh. I'll tell you why I think I can. Here's okay. why I tell you I think I can, is that if I go to startup disk, I see that drive, even though it's not mounted in my startup disk. I'm, I'm convinced if I tried to boot from it, I could. You should test that. I, I thought... I'm going to test it. All, all indications that I've gotten in that, yes, it shows up in startup disk. To me, that's a pretty strong hint that it's bootable. Yeah. If it shows I, I, up would, there, right? I would agree with that. I, I thought I had heard that, <laughs> that it would it would not do it um, with with High Sierra. If you put but it also, on and it, it also will. explicitly, Carbon Copy Cloner says... Right on the screen for the backup task, barring any hardware compatibility problems, the destination volume should, I'll say should, be bootable. So the thing is, everybody thinks that it should be bootable, and I think it, it, it even copied over the recovery partition. You know, th- th- that's one thing the Carbon Copy Cloner still does. So yeah. I'm, I, 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 uh, I'm fine. I'm, you, you uh, it's going to be homework. It. I'm yeah, going to put exactly. it on my, my to-do list, yeah. and I'll report back next week. But cool. um. Cool. All indications are that it's uh, at least certain tools and maybe the OS itself don't freak out over a APFS rotational external encrypted, by the way, when I formatted it. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll circle back to that. So we have some questions about cable modems and let's dive in. So Harvey starts us. He says, uh, you were recently discussing the variables affecting internet speeds with an ever so brief mention of routers. Speaking of which, I am using a Doxis 3.0 cable modem. It's an Aeros surfboard SB1641 or 6141. Uh, he says for my Comcast internet blast service. I regularly receive letters from Com- Comcast urging me to upgrade my modem for faster speeds, but Comcast tech support told me that switching to a Doxis 3.1 modem would not increase the speed of my connection. Can you resolve this contradictory advice? And uh, he says that Comcast uh, blast speeds should be 250 down and 10 up, which means it's a little bit more than that because Comcast actually provisions things a little bit higher so that, uh, you know, you, you would get the speeds that you're supposed to get. And sure enough, he says, uh, his wired speed tests get him 255 down and 11 up and whatever he's using to test Wi-Fi gets him 202 down and 11 up. So would a Doxis 3.1 cable modem help? And the answer that the tech is giving you is correct. You are getting your full speeds with your existing modem. So as if you were to remain with Comcast blast service, uh, you would not get faster speeds. The same provisioning profile or at least the same limits would be installed on the modem and you would still get 250 down and 10 up or 255 down and 11 up, whatever it works out to be. That that would be what you would get. There are two benefits to a Doxis 3.1 modem. Number one is the uh ability to connect to what is it OFDM John or ODFM it's a completely different signaling method uh that 3.1 brings but it is it is backwards the, all these modems are backwards compatible with with the old signaling methods and with Comcast anyway you would use that it would take advantage of that on the downstream to get you up to gigabit speeds but only if you buy the gigabit package from Comcast, and then they install that profile on your modem. So if you stay with the same profile, it doesn't matter what kind of modem you have. The second benefit, which will affect everyone, no matter what you are doing, if you buy a Doxis 3.1 modem, all cable labs, uh, which sets the standards for cable modems, said in order to call your modem Doxis 3.1, you have to use 
this new signaling and queuing method called Doxis Pi, uh, Doxis D O C S Y S I S dash P I E. And essentially, what that does is do, goes a great way towards completely alleviating any upstream buffer bloat because cable modems prior to Doxis 3.1 are awful at this. And so, putting a Doxis 3.1 modem, like for you, John, if you put a Doxis 3.1 modem in, even though your provider does not offer 3.1 service, you would still take advantage of this upstream buffer bloat um, potential fix is, is essentially what it comes down to. So, so no, uh, you won't get faster speeds, but you might get something if you're having buffer bloat problems. That said, I wouldn't necessarily recommend an upgrade unless you're having specific issues. But if you are going to buy a new cable modem, uh, thinking about a 3.1 modem has some advantages, including, of course, down the road, you could just upgrade to, you know, gigabit. And you're good to go. So that's that's my thoughts on it. How about you, John? Uh, I'm sitting tight. So I, you know, as I mentioned before, but if you didn't hear that episode. So the thing is, at some point, my provider, which I'm pretty happy with. So it's a cable vision or co- a, a cable vision optimum online. They have another name. It's a, it's like all these guys have like three different names. I, I don't know what's up with them. <laughs> Even yours, right? Is it Comcast or is it Xfinity? Yeah, they're well, trying yeah. to rebrand to Xfinity. Good luck. <laughs> it's tough. Rebranding is tough, man. Yeah. Um, the thing is, was there anything wrong with the old name? I, I don't know. But anyways, in, in their case, um, at some point I saw a charge on my bill saying uh, modem rental fee. And I'm like, well, where'd that come from? I haven't paid that since I started with you guys like like uh, over a decade ago. And they're like, well, yeah, because you changed your class of service, we uh, were going to charge you. And I'm like, OK, well, went online and actually I went to their store and I was able to purchase an heiress. Hmm. Uh, cable vision branded it actually has optimum printed on the modem so it's a deal you know so it's one especially made for them and i think i got it for 100 bucks and it stocks as 3.0 and it handles the current packages that they offer i think the maximum they offer now is 400 down and 50 up so docs is 3.1 from them doesn't make any sense so right, right. now well I'm, they don't I'm offer 3.1 yeah exactly right so i'm so I got exactly what I need at, at this point in time, and I'm not paying cool. the monthly rental fee. So, All right. And then Scott asks, uh, if I am going to get a Doxis 3.1 modem, which one do you recommend? He says, I'm seriously thinking about uh, upgrading to Doxis 3.1 through Xfinity slash Comcast. Since my 200 megabit service promotion ended and jumped 20 bucks, that means I'm only about $24 away from the one gigabit service. Hard not to give that serious consideration. And for sure, for me, it was a $17 Delta whenever it was that I upgraded. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's easy. Short money. Let's go. Um, there are essentially three Doxis 3.1 modems out there right now that you can get as a consumer. There, there's a there's a fourth Netgear actually makes a uh, home gateway device, which is a cable modem. And they're, um, I think it's a, it's a Nighthawk router. I think it's a, a tri-band router. I mean, it's, it's pretty hoopty, but in terms of just, hoopty. yeah, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, in terms of just cable modems, there are three. Um, right now, John, you are hearing me across our uh, Netgear CM1000, which is their Doxis 3.1 modem. But uh, I've also tested the Aris SB8200 and the Motorola MB8600, both of which, uh, it, all three of them work extremely well. Um, there are some people that might argue that Motorola's tech, which is really built by Zoom Electronics, but uh, that Motorola's tech is better than the other two in terms of the way it negotiates connections and headroom. But, uh, y- you know, the reality is that um, I don't have congestion problems here, so I'm not sure I would ever notice needing that kind of headroom. Uh, and, and, and mine, the way Xfinity does it is I only connect to the OFDM channel on the downstream. All my upstream is so, – so it's Doxis 3.1 on the downstream for my gigabit connection – and then Doxis 3.0 
on the upstream. Uh, and it gives me, I don't know, they say it's a thousand down. It's more than a thousand down, but you know, I use a single gig e port. So there you go. A uh, thousand is where it maxes out thousand down and 40 or 35 up. I get, I think I get 42 up or something like that. So, um, yeah, any of those three really, honestly, at this point, I would look at the price. I'll put links to all three of them in the show notes and you can, you can choose from there, but that I mean, I, it shouldn't a make a difference because standards are standards, but then standards aren't always standards. So I guess the, the bottom line is you, I mean, you, you know, get on the horn and ask them, say, which one do you guys like? In my case, they had a co-branded one with the logo. So it was like pretty straightforward. It's like, you know, I found no compelling reason to not get the heiress, whatever model they recommended, because it seemed to be a fine motive. And it was a hundred bucks. Yeah. But, again, um, it, it's some it's providers. More than, it's more than just the standard, though. It's the it's it's the hardware that's built into it. Right. And and so that 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 is different from manufacturer to manufacturer. They take the hardware, they build software and then they. Oh, no, I get it. I'm, standard, I'm just saying so. just check with your provider because they operate the gate even though they should let you use any standards compliant modem they may have a problem with this one or that one yeah right? it's true yeah th these three are certified by comcast so you can go buy them on oh, amazon great. and you're okay. fine okay yeah and yeah and any uh, almost every provider has a list of approved modems and sometimes we'll hear stories where where they get a bit too aggressive about well you can only get the smaller or the smaller yeah like, well, yeah yeah dude but i think the major providers are are pretty cool and like in my case yeah i mean eris is a you know world brand i mean it's you know it's probably gonna work just fine <laughs> yeah right 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 yeah exactly exactly but it is worth checking the list i'll put the uh comcast list on the on the, it well it's you go to my device info dot xfinity dot com i think is is where you can go and it will they know uh, it's a it's an in it, you know you you've piqued my interest because i think i may have some time to maybe research some alternative modems here. There you go. Well, like I said, next trade show we go to, it's like, hey, you guys got anything? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> that you think will be better than yeah, right. what I have right now? Right. But, uh, and then the third question we have or topic that we have on the cable modem path here is from Karsten. He says, over the last few years, there have been discussions about cable modems, routers, and so on. I have a question that I do not believe has ever gotten answered. Uh, do I have to reboot my router if I replace my cable modem? He says, Dave, with all your cable modems that you've tested, did you just hook up a new cable modem to your router and it was fine? Or did you have to reboot your router uh, as well? He says, like you, Dave, I use a Synology RT2600 as my main router. Connected to the WAN port is currently a 10-year-old Motorola modem, which is then connected to Spectrum slash Charter Cable. He says, my new modem is a Motorola MB8600 DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, and he says, uh, I, uh, he says, my plan steps are to power off the old cable modem. Yes, I would agree with this. Disconnect the coax cable from the modem and the ethernet cable. Yup. Connect the new cable modem and connect coax and power. Connect the new cable modem to ethernet, uh, to my router, power on the cable modem, and then call spectrum to add the new cable modem to the account because with them, it requires a phone call, wait for provisioning, and then boom, I'm online. He says, so here is where the rub is. Will the cable modem see the router? Uh, yes. Will the router be okay with the new MAC address on the WAN port and just accept it? Or will it freak out because it expects to talk to the old one? So here's the thing. Once you unplug the Ethernet port uh, from a device, it should completely forget about what was previously plugged into that. And more specifically, when you plug a new device in, it's going to negotiate upfront fresh. Now, so no, the answer is you don't need to reboot the router. At the very least, there might be a time in this process where you need to pull the, the Ethernet cable from either the router or the cable modem. It doesn't matter which. Give it a second, then plug it back in. Why? Because the cable modem, when it's in provisioning mode, may deliver a different IP range to your router than it will once it is up and running in normal Op fully operational mode and you can either wait for your router to realize this and get the new ip address and new ip range or you can uh you can just unplug and replug ethernet 
and then it will reset because it says, oh, this is a brand new thing. Let's let's take a look now. That's the router. The cable modem on the other side uh, is very particular. And once a cable modem hands out an address to a device, in this case, your router, it will, in most cases, especially for residential service, stop and will not hand out addresses or will not allow any other device to transmit data across it until the cable modem is rebooted. And why is this relevant? Well, with Comcast, you don't do the phone call. You can, I suppose, but you register your new cable modem with your account online and you do it across the cable modem. It, they have a whole provisioning web page and it's great, but it gets a little wonky trying to do this with a router in between your computer and the cable modem. So what I recommend for, for any, anybody that's a Comcast customer, and he's not, he's a, um, like he said, a spectrum slash charter customer. So in this case, you're going to do the phone call anyway. You don't need to worry, but to provision the modem with Comcast, what I've found to be, and I've done a lot of cable modem testing and switching them out and all that. The simplest thing is to plug my computer directly in via ethernet to the cable modem, go through the whole provisioning process. That way I'm not dealing with a router. That's trying to overthink things. Once the provisioning is done, I unplug my computer I plug the cable into the router and I reboot the cable modem. When the cable modem comes back up, its memory is wiped in terms of what devices it's seen. Then it sees the, the router and never doesn't try to hang on to the computer. So hopefully that helps, but it's the, it's the modem that you would want to be power cycling. If anything in this process, not necessarily the router. There you go. That's my, uh, that's my advice on this. No, I'm with you. And that's actually the, the, so the experience that I had, because I bought a kind of co-branded modem, yep. you know, like you said, you know, turned every, you know, shut everything down, disconnected the old one, unscrewed the cable, screw in the new cable, powered it up. And the first thing that happened is, you know, I was running, I guess, but, Safari. Wait, I, just, I just want to rewind. You said shut everything down. You just mean shut the modem down. You left your router Correct. I'm sorry. Correct. That, I just wanted to clarify. Yes. Yep. Okay. So in this case, yes. So power down the cable modem, disconnect all the cables from it, put the new, uh, hook up the new one, hook it up to the router, in this case, an Eero. And then as soon as I ran Safari, it's like, oh, something's different. And it's like, um, yeah, I kind of noticed that you had something with this MAC address, which is the hardware address of the old cable modem. And it's like, now I see this new thing. It's like, you, you want to, you know, switch over? And I'm like, yeah. And that, that was basically all I had to do. That's awesome. I think because it's one that I purchased from them. So they knew the Mac address of it already. And yeah, but, but I mean, I, I was actually shocked. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like, this is how it should always happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, here's your old device. Here's your new device. You, you want to try. And then I returned, you know, the old modem that, you know, they wanted uh, money for every month, mailed it back to them and everything was fine. That's great. Um, yeah. But it was, it was such a smooth process. So I think you're going to run into that with pretty much any major national that's good to hear that, that you were able to do it directly. Over, I didn't have to directly. deal with anybody. I didn't well, have to deal with a person, which I have had to do in the past. I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to do the provision thing. And they're like, yeah, what's the Mac address? And I'm like, oh, dude, couldn't you automate this? And they did. <laughs> well, and it, it's nice to hear that you were able to do it without removing your router from the equation. That that has not been consistently has not been my experience with Comcast. It Sometimes it works out, but when I'm testing lots of different power, things, I may have power cycled it just for good measure. But yeah. it, it, from what I recall, I, I didn't have that's to. That's great. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, they want to, you know, they, they don't want their people on the phone for trivial, you know, stuff like this. All right, now I'm going to share a, a piece of advice and this definitely falls into the, you know, don't get caught realm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Comcast for me here, we, we happen to be fortunate in a lot of ways, right? But, uh, in terms of Comcast, we are in the Boston market here in New Hampshire and Boston and San Francisco are the markets that Comcast really prioritizes both in terms of testing new things, which is why I have gigabit 
service available here and had it before most people, uh, before it was an option for most. Now I think it's, it's fairly common, perhaps not everywhere, but in a lot more places, but in we get new stuff and they also don't mess with us here. There's a lot of, you know, Comcast headquarters is, is in Massachusetts and there's a lot of Comcast employees and things like that. So they don't like to mess with things, especially in terms of bandwidth caps. So, but I figured something out that might be valuable to those of you that do have bandwidth caps. Comcast does not have a, I think their limit on the number of cable modems that can be assigned to your account is three. So it's not one, it's three and it, they are automatically rotated, right? So if it sees one, that's on your list and it will drop off, you know, the oldest one that it hasn't seen. Huh. But, but for me, you know, I was, I was rotating through cable modems. Like I was changing them faster than I changed my underwear for a little while there. Right. Because I was testing all these Doxus three, one modems and all that stuff. And I realized that I, even though we don't have a bandwidth cap, I can look in the Comcast interface on online and see how much bandwidth I've used. And I happened to look after I went through this, you know, cable modem round robin kind of thing. And it said that I had used like, you know, whatever, I don't know, you know, four gigabytes of data or something like that. I was like, oh, that's not how much I've used. I've used, you know, perhaps a terabyte and a half in the last month because I know what my usage is like. And it was looking for the usage on an old modem that was. Uh, assigned to the account. And I had essentially just confused it unintentionally by, you know, cycling through these, th these modems. And I think I, I think I had put the, whatever it was, the Netgear one on and then tried the Aris and then tried the Motorola and, you know, kind of bounced back and forth. And then I, I wound up with the, the Netgear, but for whatever reason, it was saying, well, the newest one that you tried was, I don't know, the, the Aris. And so we're going to, you know, that's the one we're tracking your usage from. And, uh, and that lasted for a long time until I was on the phone with tech support about something completely unrelated. And they're like, what is going on here? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just, you know, Joe customer. What do I know? Yeah, right. And yeah, well, they don't know. And, uh, no, I'm sure they have a note on you. Yeah, I have no oh, doubt, it's, it's man. Dave Hamilton. I have no, know. actually, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure they do have a note on me, but, um, <laughs> It, I, they've confirmed that in the past for other reasons, but, um, but you know, the guy was like, uh, we need to like this. Can do you mind? And I'm like, no, no, that's of course I don't mind. I mean, what am I supposed to say? Don't mess with it, man. Um, because it doesn't matter for me. And so now they are tracking, you know, their, their bandwidth is actually accurate uh, on that. But, uh, if you happen to be in an area where they do have bandwidth caps and, you are someone who might be hitting those. It's possible that if you had an old cable modem and a new cable modem, you might be able to get the system to stop paying attention to the bandwidth you're using. I have no idea if intentionally, in fact, I'm pretty sure that intentionally doing this might uh, constitute something, you know, along the lines of a civil tort. But, uh, you know, I don't think Comcast is really going to spend a whole lot of time hunting that down. So I just share this information. It's like mm -hmm. a tool. Whatever you choose to do with it, don't get caught. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Fun. Well, as far as I know, uh, my company has, I mean, I'm sure internally they monitor bandwidth, mm. but I've, I've never been alerted to or exceeded any sort of data cap. Do they have uh, a way of seeing what bandwidth no. they believe you're using? Okay. Okay. Well, that's a good that's a good sign. Oddly enough, uh, for the Wi-Fi that they offer, if you're a subscriber, so they also offer Wi-Fi throughout yeah. the same area that they offer cable, that they'll show the bandwidth that you've used to make you realize, you know, how much money you've saved versus naturally, yes, of course, versus your your cell company. But yeah, I, I'm not aware of. Uh, I may want to ask them. It may be hidden somewhere. Um, I mean, I can see the stats on the cable modem, but that's sure. you know that's kind of hard to extrapolate <laughs> right 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 i mean it shows the number of pieces of data that have been sent and received but it's on 24 does, different channels does so. your the eero does not show monthly data usage so yeah you don't have any way of, no of seeing that you know i think they they could of course 
So, you know, so, so we, I, I think we're both running the Eero Plus package. Yes. I, I mean, and they do have yeah. a, re- and they send you a monthly report. Um, personally, I've, I, I would like a bit more detail as to what's happening because it shows the number of events that it's looked at. So the thing is, it's looking at all my traffic. So in theory, it should be able to report the amount of traffic being sent and received if it's monitoring it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like my, my Synology router, which is what I use at the house. I have Eero Plus on my dad's system. And I actually am, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I bounce around. I'm actually right now uh, employing the new TP-Link Deco as my mesh because, you know, I got to test these things. But, um, but the Synology router, yeah, it tracks my bandwidth usage across the month and shows me, which huh. is ha- super handy because I can see which computers are using it and how they're using it. It really breaks it down and it's awesome. It, I mean, it sort of like doesn't really matter, but it's pretty good. So anyway, nice that my friend is yep. where we end. It's fun. Man, the band must have been sweating out there. Dude, How could you on yeah. Labor Day? I know, I know, I know. You should, I you should him pay him. Tri- you should pay him triple time. Uh, yeah, I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure of that. Yeah, that's a good one. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. Feedback at macgeekgab.com is the place where uh, you can. That's the address. You send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff down, whatever it is. Send it in. Send it in. We want to hear. Yeah, from you, you could also send them in to feedback. At MacGeekGab.com. That's true. You know, and I know it's weird, but we even have a third email address. It's feedback at Uh, just in case the other two don't work. Like, you know, if, if those lines are busy, then you need the third one. And that's that. And, and if all three lines are busy and you really want to jump to the top of the queue, premium at MacGeekGab.com is available to all of you who are premium subscribers. So feel free. In fact, I encourage you to use that if you're a premium subscriber. And if you're not and you want to become one uh, and then that's something that's possible for you, great. We'd, we'd love to have you. If it's not in, of interest or possible, that's also okay. It, like it, it, you know, it takes all of us to make up the Mac Geek Gab family and that's a beautiful thing. 224-888-GEEK is the number that you can call and leave us a voicemail or text. And John Geek is... Four, three, three, five. Indeed. I want to mm. thank Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth. I want to thank all of you for visiting the Mac Geek Gab forums at MacGeekGab.com slash forums. Great activity there. It's good. Let's 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 even let's kick it up a notch. Let's let's try. We've done it before, but if you all ask your questions on the forums, we can do an entire show of questions that came from the forums, which would be awesome. So that would make me really happy. Wow. So MacGeekGab.com slash forums. That would be great to uh, to do. And, uh, of course, thanking all our sponsors. Of course, crossover from CodeWeavers at CodeWeavers.com slash MGG. Smiles PDF pen at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. Other World Computing at MaxSales.com. Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Ring. Ring.com slash MGG. Some good deals there. Good stuff. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks, on this Labor Day or after Labor Day, because that's probably when you're listening. It's always fun. We always appreciate it. John, three words. Three words. What are (laughs) they? Oh, not those three words, but the other three words. (laughs) Okay. We'll talk about the other three words at some point in the future. But the three words I think Dave is referring to is don't get caught.